This is the Borderless Crypto Podcast. Hello there, this is George and I'm excited to share that apart from my long form interviews, I'm starting the Borderless Crypto Shots. These are select excerpts from my regular talks, which give you a concentrated chunk of information on a specific topic in just 5, 10 or 20 minutes at most. This crypto shot features Danny Oshin, the co-founder of the Terra Stablecoin and Payments Network, who explains what makes Terra fundamentally different from all established stablecoins. Now it's time to get the podcast started in... Three, two, one. Could you please explain what is Terra and how is it different from the other established stablecoin projects, right? Everybody knows about Tether. There's already way more legit projects out there in the space. True USD has been here on the podcast. PAX, we've seen, you know, fiat backed stablecoins, algorithmic stablecoins or attempts of algorithmic stablecoins and die with its crypto-backed stablecoins. So how does Terra compare to all of this? Yeah, I think a couple fold. So we like to introduce ourselves as a blockchain-based payment network. So stablecoin is a very important component of what we do, but that's not the totality of what we're trying to accomplish. So on that note, I would say the biggest difference between us and some of the stable coins that came before us is that we have an extremely powerful go-to-market strategy. So we have what's called a Terra Alliance, which is 25 e-commerce companies across Korea and Southeast Asia, that with some of them being unicorns in their own right, that have all agreed to push Terra and its payment network to its consumers when the time is right. And they're pushing it to their consumers because, like I said, we're saving them millions and millions of dollars on every transaction every year. And what that allows us to do is, like Alipay did with Alibaba, really piggyback on a growing e-commerce market to first capture tens of millions of users. And that allows us to build liquidity pools across many countries in Asia And thereafter, we can really build other decentralized finance features like credit or investments or uh, remittances and so on and so forth. So I guess you can think of it as we focused a bit more on go-to-market strategy because we felt like, number one, millions of customers using it. And number two, the currency being tradable for goods and services across the world is a fundamental requirement for a stable coin to succeed. Absolutely. No, I actually absolutely love this approach that is really different from, let's say, you know, through USD, USDC, USDT, PAX, or all the other fiat-backed stable coins, which are essentially the real biggest and probably only use case today is to trade and to, you know, trade crypto and then have a stable alternative, which uses a tool. And although at the moment I started thinking more of stablecoins, I thought this can be great for remittances, this can be great for commerce, they're not really used for that. And so you go the other way around where because you have the customer base, you say, let's start with actual usage for buying and selling goods and services. And I guess later on, possibly this could in a naturally evolve into era being a, also used as a stablecoin for trading, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we think trading pairs on exchanges is a legitimate use case, but sure. at the end of the day, it's a very, very niche use case. So the way we thought about it is piggybacking on e-commerce, which is not only multitudes larger than the trading pair use case, but also one that happens to be growing at double digits across many of the developing countries is one that allows us to drive mass adoption very, very quickly. and. Once we are tradable for goods and services in lots of the countries that we operate in, that actually significantly adds to the stability of the currency itself. If you know that you can take a Terra and buy computers with it, buy clothing with it, buy diapers with it, 
or whatever it may be, then that adds legitimacy and real value to the currency rather than it being simply market made on an exchange. No, absolutely. That's, you know, and that's a lot of the mainstream, what mainstream people say, you know, people who are not into crypto yet, they say it about Bitcoin, but I could say the same for USDT, you know, why accept Bitcoin payments when I cannot go to the store and that Bitcoin to buy stuff, right? Now, why did you not choose, because you also have a, this major difference with most existing stable coins that they are, let's say, USDT, which set the example, and all of, or most of them after USDT, they have supposedly one US dollar or one fiat currency backing up each of the stable coins out there. Why didn't you go for this way where you just create a stable coin that is, you know, promoted across your e-commerce system and that is simply backed by fiat currencies and you chose an alternative approach? Yeah, that's a great question. And obviously, fiat-backed currencies are the easiest to create. So we thought about that in our brainstorming. But I guess the simple reason is going back to our discussion on use cases. On exchanges, because every other currency was extremely price volatile, having something be stable in and of itself was valuable. But if you look at e-commerce or the real economy, where you have the option of using credit cards, you have the option of using you know, bank transfers, or simply using cash, and they're all stable, having a digital stable currency in and of itself is actually not useful. So we needed to think of a way where we can actually tangibly incentivize users to switch over from their incumbent methods to the new one that we're proposing. So it's a good segue to get into how Terra works, but basically Terra uses a elastic supply to uh, control the price. So if demand for Terra goes up, obviously there's upward pressure on the price of Terra and we increase the supply of Terra to bring the price back down. If demand for Terra goes down, then we conversely buy up Terra and burn it to bring the price back up. So again, the elastic supply is what's keeping Terra to its peg. The interesting component is that as we integrate with more and more e-commerce companies, we're able to drive upward demand in Terra, and that allows us to increase the circulating supply of Terra. And that, in economics terms, is generally called seniorage. So we take that seniorage and we reinvest that into giving discounts on every purchase for the consumers on these e-commerce platforms. So you would go to the checkout page and you'll see options like, you know, pay with Terra, pay with uh, PayPal, pay with Visa, so on and so forth. But Terra method will be five to 10% cheaper than any other method that you can pay with. And that will allow more people to select Terra at checkout, which puts upward pressure on the demand of Terra again, which allows us to increase the supply, which allows us to then print even more discounts. And this virtual cycle allows us to really drive growth of Terra's economy. That's really fascinating. That's what I love about your approach. So essentially, you're making it a no-brainer decision for the end consumer to choose paying with Terra using Terra instead of any other payment option simply because he saves money. Yeah, because ultimately payments is a process that takes like a matter of seconds, right. right? So you can only be so much more convenient than the alternative in today's world. So we think the most tangible benefit you can give to merchants is cheaper payment processing costs. And the most tangible benefits you can give to consumers is discounts. And we've designed the model where we're able to do that on an ongoing, sustainable basis. This was Crypto Shot number one with Daniel Shin. To understand even better how the Terra engine works, how it compares to Facebook's Libra, and why there will be multiple Terra stablecoins, listen to the other Crypto Shots in episode 13 and 14, or to the whole 40-minute discussion with Daniel in episode 15 of the Borderless Crypto Podcast. 
Before you leave, I want to draw your attention to Nexo, without which this episode wouldn't be possible. If you're like me and you believe the long-term value of crypto will grow, then Nexo might be a useful tool for you. The company is the leading crypto lending provider, allowing you to get instant access to cash in 45 fiat currencies without selling your Bitcoin, Ether or other crypto assets. You can use Nexo's loans to make new investments, to cover your personal, business expenses or for anything else you like. Now, in case you don't need a cash loan, Nexo can also generate you passive income, up to 6.5% per year on your stablecoins or euro. What's more, interest is paid out daily, meaning you can add or withdraw funds at any time you like. You should know that the level of automation, convenience and flexibility that Nexo provides are vastly superior to what any other similar service offers. This is the reason I myself joined the Nexo team. Having said that, none of this is investment advice. I just genuinely believe those services might be useful to you. You can explore more at nexo.io. Thanks for listening to this crypto shot. I'll talk to you soon again. Thank you.